Our series interviews for Saving America establishes that the world is full of interesting people. We welcome Ken Good for his first appearance on Saving America. He graduated from Hardin Simmons University in 1982 with a Bachelor of Arts degree. He received a Master of Education degree in 1986 from Tarleton State University. In 1989, he earned his law degree from Texas Tech School of Law, where he was a member of the Texas Tech Law Review. Mr. Good has argued cases before the Supreme Court of Texas, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, along with numerous courts of appeals, including the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. He is the author of Good on Bail, a practice guide created for the bail industry professionals. In addition, he has written numerous articles on the subject of bail reform, including what successful bail reform looks like. Mr. Good is married and has two daughters. Well, thank you very much for having me. I feel like I'm racing to try to catch up with you after listening to that. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes we have to shorten the bios so that we can have <laughs> enough time for the interview part of the of the uh, meeting that we have here. Hey, on the Zoom. most important thing you said is I'm married and have two kids. Yes, well, I'm I'm one one notch up. I'm I've got a bunch of kids and I've got seven grandchildren. You need to get uh, to the next gen. You start counting the grandchildren. <laughs> I'm telling you, you're bragging now. You're making me very very jealous. You'll get there. I promise you. It's a <laughs> it's a trip. Well, as you know, our format is we ask our guests three questions. So first, tell us about the organization Professional Bondsmen of Texas. Well, let's see. I would describe that as the voice of the bell industry in Texas. It's it's uh, an organization uh, that's made up of um, bell bondsmen across the state of Texas, but they also are very active. They have a, a legislative committee, so they're active at the legislature. I, I'm on the board of directors, and I'm on the legislative committee. I We propose bills to the legislature, and we, um, we are a resource to the legislature on bail issues, uh, and we should have an active session coming up. We also, we have... Uh, other committees that are very active. We have an annual meeting in uh, oh in in the next few months, and so we're actively getting ready for that. And so I would describe our organization mostly as a resource to uh, legislatures across the country and uh, the public to educate them about bail related issues. And I think we we have a blog that highlights important uh, stories in the criminal justice area, and we also have our own podcast, which we call the Bell Post. You can find a link to it on our website, pbtx.com, but you can also just go to thebellpost.com and you can find uh, our um, uh, shows that we've done about all kinds of different criminal justice issues. Well, that sounds like a pretty important organization. Uh, now, Ken, many Americans are concerned about persons accused of serious crimes being released without cash bond. Does that really make the community less safe? I think that we are finding, well, we've always said yes. The answer to that question is yes. Mm -hmm. But I think during COVID, we found that there was a lot of data that supported that. There was uh, Yolo County in California released a study after COVID where they found that people released on uh, cash bonds by the private industry versus people released on simple release, which would be no cash bail. It's just called different things across the country that people released on uh, just simple release with their promise to come back had a 200% greater chance of, of committing a violent offense in the next 18 months. And that's, I think, a devastating number. I mean, think about it. Just the type of release that you're using puts the defendant or has a 200% greater chance of putting them in a worse position. How is that even possible? Well, the way it works is once you're released, the, the, the release mechanism determines your rate of return. So, you know, the, the private industry has the lowest failure to appear rate. These no cash bail systems have a very high failure to appear rate. So if there's an 80 percent chance, like in all misdemeanor courts in California, because they use simple release, if there's an 80 percent chance you're not going to come back to court or that your case is going to be put on hold until you come back, because you miss court, well, there's a great risk that that is going to create chaos because the same number of cases are being filed on average. And that puts an incredible pressure on courts to just dismiss cases. Chaos creates de facto decriminalization. De facto decriminalization, decriminalization is a green light for criminals to commit more crime. And that's what we've seen. Well, it, uh, it does seem that, uh, 
that this situation is really we're, we're running kind of a test situation here in parts of the country with this no cash bail and uh, it sounds like the the report so far is it's not working I, I think that's absolutely correct. And the problem is, it's not that we are trying something that we have studies that say we should try this. We're trying something that's never been done. And we're trying something that that the experts would say there's there's no there's nothing compatible with the private industry. That's the reason why it's been around for 200 years. All of these other things we're trying have not been tested. They've, they've never been shown to work and they have a huge uh, fair to appear rate, and but we're doing them anyway, so we're having the same results that we've had in the past. Amazing, and I have to ask kind of an entertainment question as our third question today is, uh, you know, there's a, been a reality TV show of, about bail bondsmen. Uh, there was a fictional show, uh, Lee Majors, The Fall Guy, where he was a professional stuntman, but when he wasn't doing that, he was out finding people that had skipped out on, mm -hmm. on their bail. And of course, if the person, if the uh, accused skips out on their bail, your bonding company still has to pay that cash to the court if they can't deliver the person. So how does the what we've seen on television compare with what happens in your day-to-day -day life? Well, I think the day-to-day -day life is a lot more boring. Um, there's always a few exceptions to the rule, but, you know, let's start with the general, gen, the general stuff. So when you fail to miss court, you get scared. You don't know what's going to happen. So the bondsman calls you, talks to your family and assures you, hey, this is what you can expect. Come on, we'll walk you back to court. And so I would say a large number of time people just get a call, they trust their bondsman, they go back to court, they get their case back on track pretty quickly. But we, but the problem is, like in Texas, bondsmen don't have the ability to arrest. So we can find them, and then we can call the police and say, hey, we know where the defendant is, there's a warrant for his arrest, will you come and pick him up? Okay, that's another area. But then there's the, you know, the people that are, uh, they know what's going to happen to them if they go to court. And so, they know they're going to spend some time in the pokey, and so they're not going to come back willingly. And so we have to uh, hire what we would call recovery agents. And I think some of those are what uh, maybe the extreme cases are what you see television shows about. Uh, and that's what people who are paid to go and serve that warrant and take them back into custody. There's been some cases on that recently that are very uh, uh, eye-opening, you know, people crossing state lines with someone. And if they don't have the authority to do that, they get the bond, you know, the recovery agent gets charged with um, kidnapping under the federal statute. So I think we're becoming very adverse of what we can and cannot do. We don't want to cross the lines and we don't want to be too aggressive, but we also want people to fulfill their promises, their promises to go to court. And if they don't, then we have agreed that we will do everything that we can that's legally possible to get them to court. The bonding companies in Texas cannot arrest, but we can hire private detectives who can. And uh, and so that's what happens in the extreme cases if we cannot convince them to come back. Ken W. Good, this has been uh, fascinating. How This is such an interesting area. How can our audience get more information about you and about the professional bondsmen of Texas? They can go to our website, pbtx.com. Uh, that's um, We also have a Facebook page. We have a Twitter account. They're all linked on our Facebook page. We have a YouTube channel. Uh, we have, as I've mentioned before, we have our own podcast called The, uh, the Bell Post. And we have a blog where we highlight all these stories in the criminal justice realm. Uh, to, you know, I think it's so important that we're out here telling this story of how the criminal justice system works. Because if you just listen to the advocates for change, you know, I don't know if anyone's telling the story that we're telling, and, and that is something that's been around for 200 years and why it works and why it works so well. It just does one thing and it gets people back to court. All you hear is we need to change. We need to be more fair that what we're currently doing is not constitutional, even though the courts keep saying it's constitutional. And so we, we're highlighting really the, the good stories of the criminal justice system, even though all you hear in the news sometimes is the bad. I understand. Well, thank you so much for joining us today.